Do you want to guarantee, absolutely guarantee that your high performers leave your team? Do you want to tank your employee stakeholder engagement surveys? Or maybe at the end of the day, you want to be stressed, exhausted, and frustrated so you don't even have time and energy to be with your family. I don't think that's the case. In this episode, four reasons that micromanagement is toxic and why it's actually more toxic than you think. I'm Daryl Black, and if we haven't met before, I have 30 plus years in crisis leadership, things like Hurricane Katrina and Canada's two largest disasters, a decade in corporate project management. And I take those lessons and I help leaders really grow their impact, grow their influence, and boost their income. All right, I get it, I get it. Micromanagement, you know, it's funny, over the last, well, at the time of recording here, we're experiencing a pandemic. Well, I'm here to tell you that I think we've been experiencing something epidemic in our workplaces for a long, long time. Before we dive too far into micromanagement and why it's so toxic, let's talk about why it is so prevalent and why maybe people, even yourself or your boss, tend to micromanage. There's a few different reasons. Some of them are a little bit deeper and psychological than others, but one of them is this analogy or this uh, this saying that we have, if you want a job done right, you got to do it yourself, right? That's very much ingrained in us, I think. Another reason is chances are as a leader, you have been promoted through the ranks or through a rank, and there's a real possibility and likelihood that you the reason you got promoted was because you were really good at doing that thing or those things, that function. So you know it really, really well. That could be in business analysis, that could be project management, it could be customer service, it could be, uh, you name it. So that's why you were promoted as a leader to a leader, I would submit, is because you're really good at that thing. So as a result, when you're managing, leading people doing that thing, then you have a whole range of expertise and experience that maybe they don't even have. Another reason is stress. Stress causes us to do things that maybe when we're not under stress, we wouldn't necessarily do. So there's a, a tendency to exert some sort of locus of control, it's called, and stress really amps that up where the the human organism us our brain our mind wants to really take control because it gives it a sense of, of predictability and security and all sorts of things that really upset our minds and our brains and cause fear and so when we're under fear when we're under stress there's a tendency for us to even deep dive even further all of that is completely normal all of that is legit all of that is acceptable in terms of reasonableness. Here's the problem though. Micromanagement is the antithesis in four particular ways, which I'll, I'll get into, that really ensure that your high performers and team members and yourself, that at the end of the day, you're not content. At the end of the day, you're not fulfilled. At the end of the day, you're not happy. Uh, maybe you're busy, but not productive. And micromanagement is such a toxic behavior as a leader, and uh, it is an absolute epidemic. You think that you're mentoring, you think you're, you're coaching, you think that you're, you're moving outcomes along the way with your team and team members, but you're actually eroding, and in some cases not even eroding, but exploding the, the connection that is required, the trust and, and all of those other things. So reason number one that micromanagement is so toxic and why it really flies in the face of trust and teamwork is that one of the key satisfiers at work, and think about this for yourself even, one of the key satisfiers is what we call autonomy. Autonomy is just that, independence at work, the independence to do your job unfettered, to, uh, without a micromanager, to make the decisions that you need to make, to manage your time as you deem fit, to make sure that the deliverable is met on your terms. And so how you go about that is entirely up to you as an individual, as an employee. And again, think about this in your own life. We actually really value our freedom, our autonomy, particularly at work. But when we micromanage, that's absolutely crushing that. It's flying in the face of autonomy. It's the exact opposite. So as a result, the autonomy, which is a huge satisfier and huge driver of contentment and fulfillment at work, is knocked off the table. So that's reason number one. So it's lack of autonomy is what micromanagement does. 
The second reason is the respect influence. And without going into a ton of detail here, there are really five sources of influence that a leader has, and they are growing in the spectrum of least influence to the most. First one is position influence. I have influence over somebody simply because of my position. Okay, I'm a director, I'm a VP, I'm an EVP, I'm a CEO, whatever that is. That's default. Thanks for coming out. So that's number one. The second way that leaders can influence is through discipline or coercion. And what that is, is it's an influence that is exerted because I have the ability to punish you, essentially. I have the ability to uh, cause you some sort of friction or some sort of pain at work or in the community or whatever that is. Okay, so that's the second one, that's discipline. The third source of influence is reward influence. So I have influence over somebody else as the leader because I have the ability to reward them. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is compensation. We always think about, well, I have the ability to give people raises. True, in a lot of cases. Yeah, maybe you're gonna have to fight for it and all the rest of it, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but that's okay. Uh, but that's the first thing that comes to mind, I think, in terms of reward. I have the ability to pay somebody more money. In a future episode, I am going to be talking about the five ways that you can really drive fulfillment, and not one of those five is money, by the way. So the monetary reward actually only goes so far. So you want to make sure that you're doing some other things with reward. And you can actually do what we just talked about, give somebody more autonomy, for example. Okay, so we've got Position influence, we have discipline or coercion influence, we have reward influence. Remember, this is a spectrum from, from weakest to strongest. The fourth one is expert influence. So I have a particular expertise in an area, therefore I have the ability to influence a decision or behaviors a little bit more, regardless of where I am in the food chain. Okay, so that's number four. Number five, this is the one. Respect. Respect influence is by far and away the strongest source of influence. And I've done a lot of episodes on respect influence and why it's so important. So I'm not going to pontificate here. But suffice to say, if you think in your own lives, in your own careers, a, a leader that comes to mind that you want that 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 is is representing everything that leaders should be or could be, chances are very, very strong that you have a strong respect for them. And the reason that you have a strong respect for them, ready? It's because they respected you. So when you're micromanaging, essentially what you're telling a teammate, either overtly or, or inadvertently or covertly, is that you don't respect them. You don't respect their experience. You don't expect their respect their intelligence. You don't uh, respect their opinions. You don't value them. And I get it that, again, this is probably not something that you're conscious of, but essentially when we're talking about influence, we're talking about subconscious behaviors and connections. So respect influence is so, so powerful, but when you micromanage, you're essentially throwing that all out the window and you don't even know that you are. There's a big blind spot for that. So I recognize that. That is reason number two that micromanagement is so toxic. First is lack of autonomy, which is a huge satisfier. Autonomy is a satisfier. Second one is it flies in the face of respect influence. It, it erodes that or explodes it, which is ah, so frustrating. The third reason that micromanagement is so toxic, and this is now starting to get into more of yourself as the leader, is it is a huge time suck. You wonder why at the end of the day you're spent, exhausted, and frustrated, and pissy, and all the rest of it. It's because you've been micromanaging all day, potentially. And I understand that there's there are times when you have to get more involved with somebody, totally legit, maybe they're new to the job, whatever that, that is. But if you're applying that same approach, that hands-on, that involved nature, that detail-oriented approach to everybody on your team, Nah, you should probably reevaluate. So it's a huge time suck, right? You don't even have time to do your own job because you're too busy micromanaging and, and being detail oriented and telling everyone what to do and how to do it. That's a big problem. It's the how that's the problem. So if you're not delegating effectively, and we'll talk about that, and I have talked about that on other episodes, then you won't have time. It's like being surprised it gets dark at night. Like, holy shit, at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. I didn't have time to do any of my own stuff. Yeah, no kidding. 
It's because you may be micromanaging. Yeah, you could be overworked and you know, from your boss who's micromanaging, that's possible too. The fourth reason is that micromanagement's actually selfish. It's selfish. And what do I mean by that? Well, there's a huge phrase, servant leadership, and I've done an episode on that, why I don't use the term servant leadership. But as a leader, our job, our responsibility, both professionally, morally, and ethically, is to support the team. But when I'm micromanage, micromanaging, it's to alleviate my fears. It's to alleviate my concerns. It is to provide comfort to myself, even though it doesn't feel like it at the time because you're exhausted, but ultimately you're micromanaging because of you, because of you. So you are putting so much time and energy into this to make yourself feel better. And I, I get it. That's sometimes a harsh truth. And just so we're clear, guilty, guilty. I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody of micromanagement, particularly under stress. And there are strategies I've talked about in other episodes and will continue to. But I really wanted to uh, f- throw up the flag with regard to micromanagement. We all know it's bad. We all know that we don't like to be micromanaged. And we don't like to micromanage. And I wanted to talk about the four reasons why it is actually really, really detrimental and toxic. So again, autonomy. It really flies in the face of autonomy, which is a huge satisfier. There's four others, by the way, which I'll cover in the next episode. Okay, so it flies in the face of autonomy. It really flies in the face of that respect influence, which as we talked about is the highest level, the strongest sense of influence. It's a huge time suck. Like, are you kidding me? Man, no wonder you don't have time. And fourth is it's selfish. It's actually the antithesis. It's the opposite of servant leadership. It's the opposite of supporting, even though the little insidious trap or trick is that it feels right. It feels like you're supporting, but it's in disguise. It's, it's, uh, there's trickeration happening there, all right? So hopefully that helps. Think about that. Just be more aware of that, those kinds of things and why micromanagement is so bad. And if you can, try to avoid that. And also, if you are being micromanaged, I would also submit to you, maybe start to really validate your feelings or your, your opinions based on the four things that I just talked about. Remember to like, subscribe, share, comment, do whatever you can. Thanks for watching.